Bible with you this morning. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, and uh, we're going to talk on the simple subject of sowing seed in fallow fields, sowing seeds in fallow fields. Now, I'll tell you, I'm not a farmer. I grew up in Springfield, Illinois, city. Uh, we have some of the ble- best black dirt in all of the country in Illinois, but I, I was not a farmer. I did do some baling hay, and that's the reason I'm not a farmer. <laughs> We had a uh, garden in the back yard, and that was enough to make me, uh, I'm just glad that Walmart has vegetables. I mean, I just, I don't know why I need to go out and fight with weeds when I go to Walmart. I just, you know, I'd rather deal with plastic bags than weeds. That's just the reality of it. So I appreciate people that have green thumbs and grow things. That's just, uh, and, and I, I listen, I lived in Africa, and man, it's all agriculture. You can be the president of a bank, but he doesn't care about that. He cares about his shamba or his farm back home. That's how they think. So I was around a farming community for 10 years in Africa, uh, but I still like Walmart vegetables. But anyway, uh, so sowing seed in fallow fields, we're definitely going to have to lean on the scripture for this because I don't have any great stories about it. I, that's not where uh, I've lived. But there, there's spiritual principles here. And so if you're in Matthew chapter 13, we're just going to read the first eight verses if you're physically able, if you would stand as we read this narrative here. And it says, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and the great multitudes... Now, this wasn't a multitude, but he's in a situation where people are coming from cities and towns throughout the days, days on end. And, and today, there's another great multitude were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up, and some upon stony place where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprang up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell in good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, and some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. And then, of course, verse 9 goes on to say, who, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And we hope to hear some things this morning in a few moments. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. But without the Holy Spirit, Lord, we're going to be wasting our time. So may he help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. You know, he's beginning here to speak a parable. And uh, the disciples actually said, why parables? It's a kind of a Greek word, parable. Uh, that uh, is, it's a placing of one thing by the side of another. The placing of one say, thing beside, beside another. And uh, so I could pull a certain person up here and I could stand next to them to show you uh, how good looking one of us was compared to the other. But I don't want to uh, embarrass anybody, especially myself this morning. Uh, but, uh, and so it's a comparison. Uh, we've come to see it as an earthly story or an earthly example that teaches a heavenly truth, but it's really comparing one thing to another. It's hard for us to see and understand spiritual things, so Jesus sets them beside things we do understand because he's dealing in a time where people sowed seeds. They didn't have machines that planted, machines that, that harvested. They did that by hand, and it was a lot of different work back then. How many of you have turned ground with a djembe or with a hoe, just turned it? I don't mean with the rototiller. I don't mean with a tractor and a plow. I mean you've turned it by hand. Yep, see? Now, you know what I'm talking about. I've done that in Africa. That's why I like Walmart vegetables. But <laughs> anyway, uh, and, and so the reality is uh, he's trying to teach them some things. And then Matthew 13, they ask him why parables, and he says in verses 10 through 13, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Why are you comparing things to things you're telling earthly stories uh, with heavenly truth in them rather than just telling us how it is? That's why they're asked. Why don't you just speak plain? And he says in verse 11, He answered and said to them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Who are are the them? Pretty much the religious leaders. The people who are a bit hard-hearted towards the things of God, the people who wouldn't submit to God. And so God says, listen, when my people want to know the truth, I will help them to understand it. But I don't want the unregenerated heart, and I don't want the secular mind to understand things. I want that to be a gift to my people. People don't understand what you mean about seeing your loved ones again when they die in the Lord. People don't understand why uh, you get up every Sunday morning and you dress up and you go to the house of God. They don't get that. And so he said, listen, even the religious leaders who are supposed to know better, they're not going to get this. He says in verse 12, for whosoever hath 
to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. This is interesting. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. I, it's interesting. You see somebody, they come to church, and they love the Lord. They're serving the Lord, and, and, and they know spiritual things, and then they get, they get offended. And that can happen easily. They get out of church to get away from the Lord. They quit submitting to the Lord. They quit listening to the Lord. And all of a sudden, you talk to them, and they say, I don't even know if there's a God. And you go, whoa, 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 whoa. Listen to what God says. He says, for a person, when you start responding to spiritual truth, somebody tells you that you're a sinner, and you go, well, I'm not as bad as so. But you get to understand, oh, uh, you begin to understand that you are not perfect in the presence of a holy God. And that Jesus died in your place and that you must uh, bow your heart and you must repent in a spiritual attitude and you must trust Christ as your personal Savior. And those things begin to dawn and you go to a place where a lot of people haven't gone and you submit yourself to the salvation of Christ and you trust him as your personal Savior and you've grown to understand salvation. Now you, you can see and understand things other people can't because they're spiritually discerned and the natural man doesn't receive them of course, for, according to 1 Corinthians. And, uh, and you get there, and then you all of a sudden somebody says, well, the Lord wants you to follow him in obedience and baptism. It's not a part of your salvation, but it's a picture of your submission. And you say, well, I don't think I want to do that. That's in front of people. People say to me, hey, pastor, can you baptize me like on a Thursday night when nobody's there? That kind of goes against the whole purpose of public testimony. I'm not against it. You know, we're so busy trying to make everybody happy, we forget we're here to please God. And uh, so the person says, well, I'm just not going to get baptized. At that point, you stop growing. People have been in church for years, and they, there's things in their life that the Spirit of God has spoken to them about, and they've said no. And that doesn't mean they don't, don't believe. They're, they're faithful to church, but they aren't gaining because they stop. But the person who submits to the next light, God gives them more. The person says, and when you start turning from things, even what you have, you can lose. And that's what he's warning them about. He says, verse 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither they understand. If you want to read and study the rest of that, he says, it's like Isaiah said, man, their heart, hearts are waxed cold, and their ears are dull of hearing. They don't want truth, and so I don't want to waste my time giving them truth. I want to give truth to people who want it. Right. And you know, we're going to have to quit wasting our time and wasting our lives getting upset about who don't, who, people who don't want to hear about the things of God, and we need to get excited about the people who are looking for truth. And we can choose to be those people. So let's look at this, this parable that he gives them. And obviously the, we see first the sowing seed, a par parable of the sower. Now this, this is recorded here in Matthew chapter 13, but you can also read the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4, verses 3 through 20. And you can read it in Luke 8, verses 5 through 15. So we'll throw out some verses from those two accounts. And it kind of gives you a, a view. It's, uh, there's only one gospel. There's only one story about the, uh, the life and the healing and the power and the miracles of Jesus Christ, the God-man who came to dwell among men and died on a cross and was resurrected. There's only one gospel, but it's given from four perspectives. It's given from John, it's given from Matthew, it's given from Mark, it's given from Luke. And uh, the first three are called synoptic because almost everything lines up in the matches so you can compare stories and get details from the different stories. And so we're going to look at the sower. We're going to lay some foundation and then we're going to make some application. The sower, Matthew 13, verses 36 through 37. Now, after he gives the parable about the sower of seed and the different soils that it falls in, he gives another parable about the wheat and the tares. Now the wheat basically, in comparison, are those who believe in God, they're God's people, they're God's fruit. The tares look like the wheat. They attend church like the wheat, they can sing in the choir like the wheat, they can usher like the wheat, they can give like the wheat. Sometimes they even sing better specials than the wheat. They look just like the wheat. The only problem is they don't bear any fruit. You're not going to get any bread or you're not going to get any food from the tares because they look like wheat, but they have, they're fruitless. You know, we have this idea right now, well, you know, pray a prayer and you're safe and good. It doesn't matter if you bear any fruit. That's a dangerous kind of salvation. And I'm not preaching lordship salvation this morning, but I'm telling you it's a dangerous thing because if you look at the comparison that Jesus makes about the wheat and the tares. He said, listen, uh, the, these, the, the wheat was planted by God, the tares was planted by the wicked one, and at the end of time, I'm going to come and we're going to harvest, And because and, uh, one of the servants says, hey, do you want us to root out those tares out of the choir? Well, I know one. Yeah, I bet you do. You want to get those tares out of the deacons? Yeah, I know one. 
You see how that wouldn't work well, would it? But he said at the end of time, he said, leave them there. Let them grow together. At the end of time, God's going to come and the the wheat's going to go into God's barn and be with the Lord. And the tares are going to be cast into outer fire and darkness to suffer for eternity. So being a fruitless believer may be possible, but not something I wanted to take a risk at. But the reality is he, he gives that, and I, I say that to say because he's explaining something about the sower. He says in Matthew 13, 36, 37, and Jesus sent the multitudes away. Now the large crowd that he's been teaching parables to because they're not all supposed to get it, just the ones who want it, and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. We, you know, you, I know you're saying that, but we want to make sure we're getting it right. So that's how he explains about what the weed is, what tares is. But he says in verse 37, He answered and said to them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. What he's saying is Jesus Christ, the God-man, came to give us the seed of the kingdom, to tell us things that we did not know about spiritual truth, about God and His plan for mankind. It says in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Now after that John was put into prison, that's John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news. What good news? That God has made a way for us to spend eternity with Him. But before we spend eternity with Him, there's going to be a kingdom that Jesus is going to set on the throne of David, and the way that you get into that kingdom is by having Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. By trusting him. Verse 15 says, And saying the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel. Listen, they were told about making sacrifices in the tabernacle and in the temple and all that. But Jesus said, I want to tell you something. The Lamb of God has come. And it's going to take away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God's not going to cover your sins anymore. The Lamb of God is going to take them away. And he says, I've got a new truth. I've got a new seed, and I'm planting it. And anybody that receives this seed, they'll grow up, and they'll be the wheat of God. And those who refuse the gospel will be the tares. And they'll be cast into another place, not gathered into God's barn. So we see that even though he's not talking necessarily about the sower, the first one, the sower is the Son of God. The sower is the Lord Jesus Christ. He came with a new message, and the miracles and everything of the New Testament was to confirm his message, and then that message was passed on to us. John 20, verse 21, Then Jesus said unto them, he's talking about his disciples again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. So Jesus said, I've been sent by the Heavenly Father to sow this seed of truth from God Almighty. I, Jesus is the living word, and he's given us the revealed written word. And now Jesus has called his followers, his disciples, back then and us today. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So even though you and I are sowers, technically the seed we sow comes from the sower, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see the sower is the Son of Man or Jesus Christ. Secondly, we see the seed. Mark chapter 4, verse 14, relating to our story of the sowing the seed. In verse Mark 14, 14 simply says, The sower soweth the word. Doesn't take a lot of Greek exegesis to realize what it's saying there. Matthew 13, 18 and 19, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom. See, that's what the seed is. It's the word of the kingdom. Luke 8, 11 Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Okay, so we've got in the mouth of two or three witnesses, three times the Bible tells us that the sower we saw is a son of God. The seed is the word of God that's being sown in the hearts of men. James 1.21 says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your Souls. See, it's the word of God that does the saving and the changing and the working of life. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But if the soil cannot receive the word of God, all the evangelists and all the preaching will do nothing until the soil is ready to receive the word. And so we see the seed. Uh, what does the word tell us 
uh, 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 about being saved. John 3, 3 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You need a spiritual birth. You need to be born from above. You need a Holy Spirit birth in your life. Or you can't, Nicodemus said in John chapter 3, Can I enter into my mother's womb, be born uh, another time? That's a physical birth. They said, No, that which is born of the uh, spirit is spirit. Uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. You must be born of water and the spirit. Water meaning the physical human birth, not baptism. Because he explains it himself, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Water, you came into this world. If there wasn't water, there was trouble. When the water broke, it was time. Then there is spirit. That means you had to have a physical birth, but then you have to have a spiritual birth. You have to, when you're old enough to understand right and wrong, you have to come to a place to understand that your sin debt has to be paid, and that's when you trust Christ as your personal Savior. And so the Bible says, except a man be born again. Then 1 Peter 1, 23 through 25 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is as the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Jesus came to preach the gospel. He was the sower. The seed is the word of God. We are saved by faith through the word of God, believing what God has to say and responding to it. We see the sower. We see the seed. But the third thing in this uh, parable is the soil. Matthew 13, 19 says, Then cometh the wicked one, talking about that seed that was sowed by the, uh, 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 on the wayside there. It says, uh, Then cometh the wicked one and catcheth that, uh, uh, away that which was sown in the heart. Remember, he's comparing. There was a sower, son of God. There was a seed, word of God, kingdom of God, gospel of God. Their soil, your heart. You see, he's trying to tell us something here. And uh, Mark 4.14 says, or Mark 4.15 says, Satan cometh immediately, talking about that seed by the wayside, and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Luke 8.12, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts. So I'm not trying to, spiritualize and create my own applications here. I am giving you interpretation. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about the sower is the son of God. We now go in his place. We went out yesterday. We hung gospel information. I was sowing the seed of the word of God on people's homes and doors as a representative of the son of God, an ambassador of Christ. The Bible doesn't even use the term ambassador of God, although we ambassador for Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We're ambassadors for Christ because he was the original sower. He's passed on that sowing to us. The seed has never changed. Really, the sower has not changed because it originates with Christ. But now he's talking about the soil, which is the human heart. The difference is there are four kinds of soil. See, there's only one sower. Now, I know everybody thinks they have a plan for people to get to heaven. Everybody has a plan for, for spirituality and all that. But really, God is the only one that has a plan for eternity. There's one sower. There's only one seed, and everybody tries to change that, and everybody tries to deal with that. Everybody tries to get away from that, but there's only one seed. There's only one word of God. But there are four kinds of human hearts, four kinds of soil. First of all, we see the unyielding heart. The unyielding heart is hard ground. And the problem with hard ground is the word is snatched away. We don't see this very much because, again, we don't live in an agriculture or farming community. But in, in Africa, they would have their fields, their shabbos, and they go out, like I say, with a fork djembe, and they just they dig that stuff up by hand. And what happens is you've got to be able to walk through those fields. I mean, you can't walk around. Everything is a field. So uh, you've got to walk through those fields. So wherever you walk, you create paths. And you stomp on the dirt and you walk on it. And then there's even cart paths. So animals walk and people walk and sometimes carts walk. And sometimes it's even a bit of a, a dirt road and a vehicles go through. And that ground's packed down. You ever hit one of those, that, that ground with a djembe, man, it'll jar your teeth back. And you, you, you want to get rid of your wisdom teeth, just go do that. You'll bounce them right out. <laughs> I mean, it's real work breaking up hard ground. But what happens is when that seed falls on that packed soil, there is no chance in heaven or earth for that seed to get into the dirt. And so birds come along, hey, they're hungry too, like Satan. 
There's just too much in the world. When your heart is hard to the when your heart is hard to the word of God, there's just too much in the world Satan can send by, who's the prince and power of the air and the God of this world, to snatch the seed away, and nothing's going to happen in your life. So many people do not never get saved as a result of that. They have a unyielding heart. Verse uh, Luke 18, 12 says, Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and take away the word out of their hearts, lest, listen, lest they should believe and be saved. These people didn't believe and get, didn't get saved. Scripture is very clear on that. Their hearts were so hard, the word could not get in. Mark 4, 15 says, And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. I mean, they sat in church and they understood what the preacher said, but their heart is too hard to let it enter in and do anything and change anything or convert anything. The wayside, hard, unyielding ground, no way the seed could penetrate in order to germinate and to grow. This would be like the scorner in the book of Proverbs. See, the simple in Proverbs doesn't yet know. You know, you know the, the kid touches the hot stove and ow, you know, a couple of times of that, he ought to be smart enough to quit touching the hot stove. The fool is the one who's been told. They know. They're just not yet quite ready to listen to anybody. The scorner, as the Bible says, the one who knows better, isn't going to do it and enjoys getting other people not do it. They have a hard heart and they could care less the consequences. And then the wise is the person who started out simple, got taught a few things, had some foolish moments, as we all do, and decided to apply God's word and trusted and saw that it was a better path. So this heart is a scorner's heart. They often view Christians as intolerant for believing that there's only one way to heaven. It's foolishness to them, and they want nothing to do with it. They have an unyielding heart, and with unyielding heart, the word is snatched away. But then you have, secondly, the unprepared heart. This is stony ground. The word is not snatched away, or the seed, but the word uh, withers away. Luke 8, 13 says, They on the rock, just as Jesus explaining his own parable to his own followers, they on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. I can't tell you the people that I've seen weep at this altar and rejoice at this altar. Their, 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 their life is a mess. Uh, their home is a mess. Uh, their, their relationships are a mess. They come up here and they pray and they, they just think, oh, God's going to fix everything. And they're just, they have great joy. They receive the seed. Because somebody preached a message about God's deliverance and God's power. And, 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 the, and the lady that had uh, the disease at 12 years touched him of Jesus' garment. And she got healed. And they said, oh, that's good. Let me just touch his heart, a garment. And he's going to fix 40 years of bad decisions. So they respond and, and, and things like that. But the Bible says, uh, it says, and going on verse 13, and these have no root, which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. Now you get into a discussion. Many argue whether or not these people were ever saved or not saved. And I'm not here to argue theology. Obviously, the hard heart, the, the unyielding heart, it's snatched away. It never does anything. Is this uh, unprepared heart the person that just comes to God to fix everything and accept it, and then when finds out serving God's going to cost them something, they're gone? Did they ever really get saved? That's God's business. Matthew 13, 5 and 6 says, Some fell on the stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth, and when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. See, a lot of people are all about God as long as it's all good and it's all giving. So you wonder, did a person really repent and trust Christ, or did a person try to get God on their self-improvement train? So again, I, I think if you're saved, if you're truly born into God's family, he doesn't kick you out. You're his child. He's going to chase you. You're along for the ride. He gave you eternal life. He didn't give you until you mess up life. But I think a lot of people come. They don't prepare their hearts. And when you talk about stones in the heart, it could be a lustful habit like pornography. It could be a deception like pride that you think you're doing it all right, but pride and the word of God just cannot work that you can't put something. I, I, when I came to West Virginia, I was, of course, again, I came from Illinois, black soil, you know, turn it up and plant stuff, everything grows. You come over here and West Virginia grows rocks everywhere you go. I mean, I've been picking rocks up at Camp Faith for eight years and it's still growing more rocks. 
There's piles of rocks. You pull in there and left. Those rock piles, I've been putting them there, and they still grow rocks. But you can't put seed in ground where there are rocks. And so when we have stuff in our life, even the word of God can't take hold. So faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But if the word of God withers away, nothing's going to happen no matter how much we hear. And so it's the unprepared heart. These are the kind of people who never deal with the real issues. They just jump on the Jesus bandwagon because it looks good. Those, kinds of, uh, those are the kinds of people who seem to be growing faster uh, than everyone else. They appear to have real joy and real tears, but in a few months or a few years, they're gone and act as if they never believed God ever existed. Like I said, I'm not here to discuss the theology of whether they're saved or not saved. That's just not what God intended for our lives. So you have the unyielding heart. It, it's snatched away. You have the unprepared heart. It withers away. Then you have the uncommitted heart. That's the thorny ground. And it says, and, and this word is choked away, Luke chapter 8, verse 14. And that which fell among the thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and, and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. See, here, here's the challenge is, did God save us just to get us to heaven or did he save us to be fruitful? You know he saved us to be fruitful, but it seems like many people are offering a salvation where, hey, just get saved, just, just get fire insurance from hell, and don't worry about what the Word of God says about how you live. Now, we're not always going to agree and stuff, but we ought to be making an effort to interpret it and figure it out. So it says again in Matthew 13, 22, He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. I, I, I wrote this little statement. They can hold down God in their lives. That, that's an amazing thing. You can get saved, and the Holy Spirit, the divine nature of God moves inside of you, but you are able to hold it down so nobody can see it. Isn't that amazing? That's not really what I want to do. I spend my whole life trying to mortify or put to death my flesh so that somebody might see the Holy Spirit in my life. But the people who get the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world and the schedules and, and keeping up with the Joneses, sorry Joneses, and all those kind of things, that, that, that's all about everything but what does God want in their lives. John 15, 1 and 2 says, I am the true vine and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth much fruit. You say, well, I've been a fruitful Christian. Why am I going through hard times? He purgeth it. He cuts away stuff so it will bring forth even more fruit. He says in verses John 15, verse 6 and verse 8, If any man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire. Wow. Now, is that an unfruitful Christian or is that an unsaved person? And he said that the, the tares, they're going to be cast into that fire. They never bore any fruit. And they are burned. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So whether it's revival or salvation, God desires us to bear fruit. And that is determined by the condition of the soil, which happens to be your heart and mine. So one preacher put it this way, I've known people who when they, uh, they've hit rock bottom vowed to serve Jesus and when they regained their footing and were blessed came down with amnesia. Unyielding heart snatched away. Unprepared heart withered away. Uncommitted heart choked away. But then thank God there's the unchained heart. It's called good ground and the word yields fruit. And you know what? It doesn't yield fruit the same. You say, well, boy, that person wins a lot of people to Jesus. Boy, that person can sing, and it just seems like people weep and cry and go to the altar. I know, some 30, some 60, some 100. That's God's business. The sower is the same, and the seed is the same, and even the same seed by the same sower uh, on the same good ground puts forth different amounts of, of fruit. That's not our business. Our business is just to make sure it's good ground when it lands. You let, a rock, you let rocks get into your life, and it's going to ruin what the Word of God can do. If you've got rocks in your heart, bitterness, secular mindset instead of biblical worldview, lustful things, unbelief, or maybe you're just busy with the thorns, and they're choking and choking and choking the ability. You don't have time to pray. You don't have time to spend to walk with God. So it doesn't matter what evangelist we have in. It doesn't matter how good he is. It doesn't even matter how spirit-filled he is. 
if our soil is not ready, if, it, if we don't unchain, if we don't prepare our soil, it's not going to make a great difference. So Matthew 13, 13, 23 says, But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word, understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and, some, and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Mark 4, 20, And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. The ultimate mark of salvation is fruitfulness. What is fruit? It's the evidence of the nature of God indwelling in you in the person of Jesus Christ or in the person of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be perfect. You're still going to make mistakes, but there's going to be something different when God moves in. Paul said that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Let's look around Christianity today. Do we see a lot of those things? Not nearly what we should. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. There's a testimony of a preacher. He wasn't a preacher when he... When he, when he and his wife were in a terrible car wreck, and I mean, he was mangled up pretty good. She was mangled up pretty good. He was in his apartment. He still was on crutches. He still could barely walk, but he was just uh, at the end of himself uh, due to just his life and then the wreck and, and the damage it had done to him physically. And so on his crutches, he, he hobbled ac across the street to a church that was in an area, a Baptist church, happened to be a Baptist church, and he went in and a preacher was preaching a message on the sower and the seed. And, and I'm going to read you just his testimony as he wrote it down. He said, and, and he's there now all busted up and just barely healing enough to be out from his car wreck. He said, when I heard this sermon after our car accident, I remember reflecting back on my life. How I was basically raised in church. I even prayed the prayer. I'd been baptized. I was a member of the church. But my heart was, a, uh, the, was the thorny soil. And over time, I no longer even desired the things of God. Remember, those who have will gain. Those who lose will lose what they had. Instead, I lived for myself, and I was miserable. I realized that I was sick and tired of who I'd become. I didn't want just another religious quick fix or self-help program that would soon fade away again. I deeply desired a permanent change. I remember sitting toward the back of that church sanctuary with my face wet with tears as the pastor was finishing the message. At that moment... I sat there and prayed for God to save me and to change my heart forever. I was tired of just pretending to be a Christian. I was tired of being a, the bitter, hateful, angry person I had become. I wanted my heart to be unchained, to be that good soil. I was ready to completely surrender my life to Jesus Christ, and I was forever changed. And in the end, God called me to be a preacher. I'm not saying everybody that truly gets saved has to be a preacher, but in his situation, he obviously was running from God. Whether he got right with God or got saved, in his mind, he got whatever he didn't have, and it changed his life. So that's sowing seed, different hearts. Now we're going to close with follow, follow fields. The sower is the same. The seed is the same. The soil is what is different. One heavenly truth that is, that's clear in this host's uh, uh, um, parable, you know, we say, well, was, was, was the first one not saved and the next two were saved? Of course, obviously the last one was saved or, or the first three not saved and only the last one was saved. There's one, there's one truth comparing the parable to truth of life. There's one tr heavenly truth that's clear. The soil is the heart of men. That's the one thing that we see clearly. Also, the su seed is greatly affected by the condition of the soil. So when the Bible speaks of fallow fields, it's tying itself to this parable. Jeremiah is crying out to Judah to repent before judgment came. This is right at the very end before Judah and Jerusalem. Now, Israel and Samaria had already gone in to dispersion. Now, Jeremiah is preaching right before God's going to let Babylon take his chosen people, Judah, the southern kingdom, the kingdom that had the better kings and had the better worship, but they're going into captivity because of their disobedience. So Jeremiah is speaking to them right before this happens. He says in Jeremiah 4, 1 through 3, if thou wilt return, God speaking to his chosen children, the nation of, uh, of Israel, in specifically Judah and Jerusalem, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me. And if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not, uh, thou not remove. In other words, I'm not going to have to put you under punishment. I'm going to have to send you away into ca uh, captivity. And thou shalt swear the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness, and the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. Verse 3, For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not 
among thorns. You realize that was written 700 years before Jesus was ever born, let alone before he gave the solar parable to his followers. God's saying to his children, listen, follow ground. And the thing about fallow ground is fallow ground is untilled, unplanted ground. It had not been prepared for seed for a time. They would rotate crops, so there would be a section they just wouldn't prepare it for three or four years so it could rebuild its nutrients and so on. But because of that, it would harden. The rain would harden it. Uh, if animals walked around, they would harden it. The, 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 you know, just because you're not planting doesn't mean that the, the, uh, the weeds and the thorns and the grass doesn't come back. So you've done nothing with that ground for farming, so now when it's time to farm, you got to go and you got to dig out any rocks that got in there. you got to go and you got to dig out the weeds and the thorns and the bristles and any bushes that might have grown in there. you got to prepare it to be planted. And God is saying, listen to my children, your hearts have to be prepared for my word. So we're having revival at the end of the month. What, 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 what should I do? What should I do? Yeah, you know, we just, well, boy, I just hope God will just move. I hope God will just show. No, God says, no, no, you don't understand. Start preparing your fallow ground. Get your heart ready. There's going to be some good word. There's going to be some good preaching, but it won't mean anything if you have an unyielding heart. If you've let the world stomp on your heart to the point that it's so hard that nothing's going to get in there. Now, like I say, interpretation is one, but application is pretty broad. Even a Christian can let their heart get trampled into the point where nothing's getting in. Maybe you have an unprepared heart. Stuff has got into your heart. You just need to get it out of there because the word of God's not going to do anything until you do. Maybe you have an uncommitted heart. It's just you're so busy with the world, the cares of this world, the deceitful, the rich. It's just choking and the word of God. It's not that you're not saved. You're just not fruitful. Can't be. You don't have time to be. It says again in Hosea 10, 12, Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Wouldn't it be great if God just came and rained righteousness upon us? If, if he just come and helped us and showed us what we needed. So that brings us to a practical thing here. Awaken 2021. It's a 21-day prayer journal. It's supposed to start next Sunday. Now, please do me a favor. Don't take this. I, I have all kinds of stuff I have in my library that somebody gave me and I took and I put on the shelf and I've never read it. Don't take this not to read. Just leave it so, because somebody might use it. If you're not, listen, I'm not up here saying everybody's got to do this to love Jesus. Everybody's got to do this to be saved. I'm just saying, listen, there's many ways to prepare for revival. Scripturally, to me, this is one of the best of them. Let's prepare and plow up our fallow ground. Whatever's got in. Every day is just a single one-page devotion. Not a book to read, just one page, one day. It's got some verses and some certain things to pray about. It does have, in towards the back, a inventory of your life. Now listen, you read this, you're going to think, well, man, is he talking about lordship salvation? No, he's talking about fruitful Christian living. There's a big difference. Most people are saved, but they're not necessarily fruitful. So yes, this will seem pretty intense. Don't take it personal, but take it personal. Because you'll read it and you'll say, well, I, gee, I must not even be saved if I'm living. No, that's common American Christianity. It's cultural Christianity. It's comfort zone Christianity. That's, that's where we live. That's okay. The question is, this is individual. Now, you know, a, a husband and wife may want to do this. A, a father might want to do this with his children. I would say probably children 13 and above should, should have to be at least 13 to be able to do this with any, probably maybe even probably 16 and above because this is pretty intense. But you could get one and go through it with your children. The, the bottom line is there's going to be some tough questions to answer, some things to pray about, and, and getting our hearts and minds prepared. And here's the thing. Your preparation will be different than my preparation. We get together. You've got to listen to me pray about my problems. This is where you get to take a, journal, a journey and a journal, and you pray about your family, your needs. You get real with God. You get your heart ready, and then see what God does when the preacher shows up with the Word of God. The sower's the same. The seed's the same. This book is all about the soil. How is your heart? The cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches keeping you back spiritually? Or are there some stones that are really holding you back? Or has your heart been so trampled by the world that you can't even get the seed in anymore? Or is it unchained? And God's going to make you fruitful by showing you what's next in your walk with Him through revival services. So there's about 80 of these up here. We're going to have an invitation. My invitation is to come and take one or two, however many you need for your family. We can keep making them if you keep taking them. But please don't take them if you're not going to use it. Don't take it just because you're interested in reading it. Take it if you say, God, I'm going to take the time 
and I'm going to go on this journey. There's also information about a Daniel fast. We preached on that. 20, it's, it's, it's ways of fasting where you're not just completely not eating. There's different ways of things to give up at different times, different ways. It explains all that. It's very much, I, I just didn't want to do group things. I wanted you and your family to have a personal journal and a personal journey if you want to take it. Everything in there is from the scriptures. It's very challenging. It's focused on revival. It's focused on the lost people. It will lift you out of me-centered world into Christ-centered world, at least for those 21 days, if you spend one day. And we're going to incorporate this. We're going to be mentioning it more in our Wednesday night and Sunday night than on our Sunday mornings. I'm not going to burden the Sunday morning people with this, but I am going to encourage the Sunday night and Wednesday night people. We may pray over some of the things. We may go over some of the things that's been in the last few days. I want this to be a journey that our church takes together. Evangelist is going to come. He's going to preach. And before you know it, you're going to be Christmas shopping if you're not already. But here's a time in the month of October to do some preparing of our follow ground. And so we're going to do that. Now, if you're online and you want one of these, let us know in the office. That's why I did it this week. So we'll have another whole week. And next week, Lord willing, I'm going to preach on how to stand up by kneeling. It's time to stand up for God and to stand up for what we believe in. And the best way to do that is to kneel. We're ready to fight. We're ready to shoot. We're not all ready to pray. We're not all ready to humble ourselves before Almighty God. Let's stand together. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I, I guess the most important thing this morning is not that you get one of these pieces of paper or that you agree or disagree with the revival or you come or don't come to revival. most important thing this morning is are you sure that you've ever received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that the Word of God has actually taken place and you're a child of God. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm not going to come to anybody, embarrass anybody, but you say, Preacher, I know there was a time and a place when God spoke to my heart, the Word of God got through to me, and I'm not pretending I trusted Christ as a Savior, and I know that my home is in heaven because of the Word of God. Would you raise your hand as a testimony of that? Hands all over the place. Appreciate that. You may put your hands down. Anyone here this morning, you say, Preacher, I'm working through this. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to make you make a decision this morning, but I do want to pray for you. You say, Preacher, I, I've, I've been dealing with this. I've been wanting to settle this in my life. I'm not sure where I'd spend eternity. Would you pray for me? I won't come to you. I won't embarrass you. I'll just pray for you. Anybody like that, lift your hand and say, Pray for me, Preacher. I'm trying to make sure that I've got this thing settled. All right. And then I challenge for believers, when we have the song here, just come up, take one of these, take it, pray over it, you know, you, can't, you might want to read through it like a book, but I really want to encourage you to take it day by day, each day starting on the 10th, right up to the day before revival. Let's not get in a hurry. It's not a book to read about revival. It's a journey to walk towards revival. Father, we thank you for really strangely clear teaching about the seed, about the sower, and about the soil. And then, Lord, to add the challenges, we could look in many other places that talk about the fallow field preparing it for the Word of God. And Lord, we have revival coming up, and we could have cottage prayer meetings, we could have days of fasting, we could have 12-hour prayer things, and we do that. But Lord, so many people are not able to get to those things, but there's nobody that couldn't take a personal journey of prayer and fasting if they are led to, but just seeking a closer walk with you in preparation for their hearts to be ready for what's coming. Lord, that doesn't mean everybody in our church has to sell their house and go to the mission field. It just means all of us could be a little bit closer to you when revival comes or when revival's over. We could have a greater eternal vision, and that would be awesome. So I pray you just speak to hearts. I don't want people taking this just because the pastor wants them to do it. I want people taking this because in their heart there's enough hunger, enough thirst to pursue a 21-day challenge. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take the time to be holy, 509. As we sing, the altar's open if you want to do.